I went to art school in Berkeley, California, and I was very interested in painting, lithography. In fact, lithography was my subject. Big stones and printing presses, wonderful. And at that time, I also met Peter Malka, who had arrived in the San Francisco Bay Area previously, not long before I did. He was setting up his studio in Berkeley, and it was fascinating to me. I, I liked him as a person. He and his wife, Judy, were, became very good friends. But watching him in his studio was spectacular, because he had things I'd never seen before. I'd never seen hand-blown glass. I knew about stained glass in churches, like everybody, but no idea about residential work, uh, contemporary work. And being interested in art and contemporary art, this was really good for me to see. I loved it. When I first met him and he showed me the studio and his setup and his beautiful glass, and the really lovely designs he was doing. He said, have a try, you know, try it out. Do some cutting, here, here's a glass cutter and here's some glass scraps. And so I, I spent a lot of time there just fiddling around and learning, certainly learning basic techniques. I did lots of little things and like everyone does, but I never thought I would be doing, doing it as a business or I didn't know what I would be doing <laughs> at that stage in my life. We didn't really have any life plans as such, but we would like to travel and we decided we would go to New Zealand, which we neither of us had ever been to this part of the world. We were going to spend two years here because we knew it took two years to get to know a place. I was going to do something creative because you go to a new country, you don't want to do a job you hate and I ended up taking the first job I could and it was a, an interior design job which was not my strength or my interest but it was kind of novel and it was during that time that I had a commission for a window. I did that one and that set me in a direction that uh, really became my life. Peter Mollica's influence on me was uh, very great. I didn't know about German glass at all, um, but I knew about Peter's glass. And Peter had been to Europe. He showed me slides of German glass that just took my breath away. And I can see the influence of German glass on his work was, was great. But it was Peter's influence on me at the time that I was aware of. In fact, everything I did looked like Peter Mollica. There was a New Zealand Society of Artists in Glass that was that finally came to fruition after probably two or three years of my having started glass and it was after I got into more contemporary designs and there were a few other people doing the same so the, the glass blowers and the flat glass people got together into this society that went on and still existing today we decided that we really needed to extend our view of, of glass into the world and we wanted to invite people from overseas to come and give workshops. And I wanted Peter Malika to come. Everyone saw his slides. I showed slides. I also showed slides of German work at that Terradale meeting just to show people what was out there. Everybody was absolutely impressed and we all wanted Peter to come but he suggested Ed Carpenter would be perfect because he's very good in architectural um, design and business. Ed Carpenter opened a few eyes. He, he opened all of our eyes. He was a very good instructor. He was a very good artist and his approach to architectural glass was very easy to understand. He definitely told the story of German glass through his own work. We had really the first people on, up on top of our list all came. So we had Ed Carpenter, we had Johannes Schreider, we had Jochen Prinsken. And the three of them had very different styles. It's all architectural glass. We were always looking at the buildings. We were always designing with the, with the buildings and the usage in, in mind. But they all approached it so differently. Jochen Prinsken was trying to make us 
do work that disappeared in architecture. <laughs> so I mean, we were we really were uh, shown a lot of different ways of approaching it. We met Joachim Kloos and everyone in the New Zealand Society of Artists in Glass was aware of what he did and, and his work is spectacular. The book by Brian Clark was an amazing book and it, it, it also showed his influence from the Germans in the beginning. And there, and there was Neues Glass that was an interesting magazine, although it always did tend to show hot glass rather than flat glass, but occasionally they would show flat glass. Going to Germany was, to me, the best. I went to a seminar by Jochen Prinzken, and of all the things that really took me on a, on, on a new direction, that was really the one, because I could see all of these windows myself. I could uh, feel their power and meet a lot of the people who had done them. We met Meistermann, we, we met Schreider, we met Schafrat, we met jo Jochen Kloos, we met uh, Buschulte, we had uh, ice cream with some of them, we had coffee with others, and we were able to see uh, and listen to what they had to say about their own work. That to me was the best, and I came back totally stimulated. During the workshop with Joachim Prinzken, we were taken to see the cloister of Schafrat at Aachen, and they are totally clear glass with a, a leaded pattern and total transparency in that wonderful way that hand-blown glass can do. That probably was one of my favorite places that we went. It was like skeletons, it was like bones. It was using the lead line in a way that was like a pencil point or an ink line. One of the most amazing things about going to Aachen was to sit there looking at these beautiful windows with these beautiful graphic lines and having people walk by not even looking at them. People who were there looking at the cloister, looking at the architecture, and not even seeing the windows. One of the things that I found really fascinating in Germany was the fact that you would try to find a church, you would try to look for a church. People in the community didn't even know that there was a spectacular window in it, didn't know who had done the window, even if you could get in. They had no idea who the person was, they didn't had never even looked at it particularly. And I remember that Joachim Prinzken said that um, glass artists are not in high regard. They're just not, they're not considered the artists that a painter would be. In terms of churches, they're, they're well known now. But in terms of the, the lay person who is interested in art, they're not known. I mean, it's not the art that people consider art. Definitely, there's more to Schreider's windows than we know. When I looked at his windows, what did I see? I mean, I didn't see one one hundred of what he was trying to say. But those windows at Leutersdorf, those blocks of blue with those lead lines that were just random, just branch-like random, f floating on this clear border, was very influential to me because it, it brought together all kinds of things that, um, again, I didn't understand what his motives were, but visually it was a very strong statement and very powerful influence. I love those windows. Trying to reproduce a totally blue window with some interesting lines in it is not easy. And when you think about a room that size, to keep it meditative, but interesting and non-repetitive. He did it. I, I've certainly tried to do something quarter of the scale, and it, it's just so difficult. He did it so easily. The designs in the Hamilton City Council building that I did, they were definitely influenced by the Germans. And Schreider's lines there, his random lines, his natural twig-like lines are there. Uh, the sort of breaking apart almost like a geological breaking apart of nature was influenced by Schreider, I'm sure. I worked on that in the workshop of Joachim Prinzken. I was working on that real commission when I, I went to that seminar. I was the only one with a real commission to work on. So others were doing hypothetical designs. I was doing the Hamilton City Council.
and Joachim was very helpful. I don't know that I knew how much I was influenced, but looking at it, there's no question. It was very Germanic. You can't second guess some of those complicated things that the artists have thought about when they've done. You can't, there's no way. If you can feel them, I can remember seeing a Schaffrat window that just filled the churches. All of the windows were done by Schaffrat. Going into the church, it was unbelievably overwhelming. It was in a very spiritual way. I'm not even a spiritual person. There was some heavy construction happening, and they had one of these crashing machines just beating down some kind of beam, and it was like thunder in the background. And it added to this spiritual feeling. That, I mean, it just, the whole thing gave me goosebumps. It was the most atmospheric window I've ever seen, I think. I did a commission for the Auckland District Courts in Auckland. I approached it very architecturally. It, we did have a brief. It had to be something pertaining to a multicultural society with an emphasis on bicultural. And to me, that was very clear that it, it was to, to recognize the Maori um, part of New Zealand, which even in the 80s was a bit contentious as far as me not being Maori doing the design. So I made very sure that my design that came from the Tanika weaving was something that could be um, agreed upon or approved by a Maori weaver who had some sort of say in the Maori community. And I approached her and she was delighted. My design also contained the whole hierarchy of the Justice Department. I wanted enough variation in the, in the weaving pattern that people could relate to as being individual pieces and things that you could see that were different from each other. I think that my influence from my German past influences definitely came about in the looking at it architecturally. So what the use of the building would be, the shapes that would have to be there, and how it would be visible from a distance versus up close, and the usage of the building. Part of it was the brief, but part of it also was my, my training. If you couldn't see it from the street, which is often the case with a window on, in the daytime from the outside, it would be worthless. This is a window to be seen from the outside in the daytime. Very unusual, very difficult. I'm still architectural. It's definitely still, you know, I may have had influences from other things now and just going through and past and beyond, but I'm still looking at things architecturally and I'm still looking in terms of the use of the space. I'm still looking at the, um, the light aspects, day, night, inside, outside. I don't know what my influence is anymore. Nature is a lot of my influence, and I, th I find even the natural things that I put in the windows, I'm thinking architecturally. You're looking through foliage that can go anywhere in architecture. Those years are way behind me now. I'm still thinking in terms of how I was trained to think many years ago. I don't see the influence of German glass in my work now at all, but I know that the structure is there. I'm still looking at the building. It's interesting, if I hadn't ever met any of these artists in my early days, what would my windows look like? I have no idea, but I, I have a feeling I probably wouldn't be looking at the buildings. I think I might be looking just at the light. Mm -hmm.